Buonasera, signore e signori, buonasera, benvenuti alla Casa Italiana Zarilli Marimò della New York University. My name is Stefano Albertini, I'm the director. It's a great pleasure to welcome you here for this presentation of uh, the new production of I Lombardi della Prima Crociata uh, by the Opera Orchestra of New York. Um, we are welcoming back uh, Maestro Eve Queller. She has been here other times. It's always a, a great pleasure to welcome her. Uh, Professor Izzo will formally introduce her and the artists that are with her tonight. But let me just say something on behalf of everybody who loves Italian culture uh, towards Maestro Queller. As you know, the mission of Opera Orchestra uh, in New York is exactly to bring to New York operas that are never or rarely seen in a full production, in, in, in a uh, concerto form, but full and with wonderful artists and with music executed at the highest possible level. So as somebody like me who is in the business of promoting Italian culture, what Maestro Queller has been doing with Opera Orchestra of New York is admirable and really worth of our uh, gratitude. And for this, I ask you to give her a preventive applause, please. <laughs> Of, co of course, Maestro Queller doesn't only do Italian operas, and, and we understand that. There are many other traditions that deserve to be known, but from our point of view, what she has been doing for Italian opera is extremely important. Uh, as you know, this evening is part of a series of, of events that we dedicate uh, to Giuseppe Verdi on the uh, second anniversary, a second 200th anniversary uh, from his birth. Uh, there are many other things in program. We have done already some, and Professor Itzu is going to tell you more about the things that we are preparing. And before I give the formal presentation of Professor Itzu, I would like to welcome back uh, to Casa Italiana Professor Martin Chusid and his wife Anita. Professor Chusid was for many, many years a professor in the music department here at New York University, uh, founder of the American Institute for Verdi Studies, and really somebody that contributed in, a, in an incredible way to a better knowledge of uh, Verdi in the United States and in the world. His reputation, of course, is also stellar in Italy among uh, all uh, music scholars. So it's a great pleasure to welcome Martin Chusid back to Casa Italiana. <laughs> And now, Francesco Izzo, who was a student of Professor Chusid here at New York University, where he got his PhD in, uh, in musicology. He's now an associate professor at the University of Southampton in the UK. He has taught here at New York University and he's teaching right now a, a course on Verdi and his context. Uh, that is a course that is cross-listed between Italian studies and music. So we are very uh, proud and delighted that, that Francesco is back at NYU for this. Um, he also taught at East Carolina University, and he was a visiting professor at the University of Chicago. He has published and lectured extensively on opera in 19th century Italy, France, and North America. His writings appear in Acta Musicologica, Journal of Musicology, 19th Century Music Review, Studi Musicali, The New Grove Dictionary of Music, and Musicians, and various collections of essays. He's frequently invited as speaker, contributors of program notes, and consultant at opera houses, and other institutions in Europe and the US, including Sarasota Opera, the Teatro San Carlo of Naples, the Welsh National Opera, the Royal Opera House, the Glinderborn, and the BBC. His current projects include a critical edition of Giuseppe Verdi's Un Giorno di Regno that has just been performed, I believe, in, in Sarasota, right, Francesco? Um, and uh, mm, at the end of this year, uh, a and he's publishing with University of Rochester Press. So the, the, the opera has already been performed at Sarasota, but the volume is coming out. Okay, very good. I just wanted to, to have it straight, have, have the facts straight. Um, and uh, he is now, as I told you, teaching here in the Department of Italian Studies and Music at New York University, and he co-directs the American Institute for Verdi Studies. 
And without further ado, I would like to ask you to please welcome Maestro Yves Queller and Professor Francesco Izzo. Good evening, and uh, again, welcome, benvenuti. I am uh, delighted to be um, here with you to, to have this opportunity to introduce I Lombardi alla prima crociata, the Lombards at the First Crusade, which the Opera Orchestra of New York, conducted by Eve Queller, uh, will perform at Avery Fisher Hall, Lincoln Center, this coming Monday. So this is a preview. We must make sure that we go to the performance as well. Uh, this uh, evening's uh, event uh, is uh, part of a number of activities that the American Institute for Verdi Studies organizes to mark the anniversary of the great composer who turns 200 this, uh, this fall in October. So coming up on uh, April the 24th, we have a lecture on La Traviata by Professor Rene Weiss. Uh, this is held at the Humanities Initiative here at NYU. Then in the fall, we'll have a conference devoted to Verdi and Italian opera today. The title is Verdi's Third Century, and our website will give you lots of details about this and other uh, activities. I should also mention that uh, thanks to, to a generous uh, gift by, by a donor, uh, we're now able to have an award for Verdi scholarship, and it is called, fittingly, the Martin Chusid Award, and this will be announced for the first time in, uh, uh, in October. So I really invite you to visit our website. From there, you can like us on... Uh, Facebook, and you can obtain all the information you'd like about what our institute uh, is doing. So don't uh, forget to look at the fourth page on the, on the little program you have, where I've also provided information for the Opera Orchestra of New York and, of course, for Casa Italiana, uh, Italiana Zerilli Marimo. And we're so grateful to be able to uh, be in this wonderful space again today. And thanks to Stefano Bertini for a wonderful introduction, and uh, also thanks uh, uh, to the family uh, of uh, Ambassador Eugenio Di Mattei, who've, who've given a, a, a generous contribution uh, towards this and other Verdi events this year. Ambassador Di Mattei was a lover of opera and, and uh, Italian culture, and it is also thanks to him that we're able to be here today. And now, it is really uh, such a great pleasure and uh, an honor to welcome to NYU uh, an extraordinary group of instrumentalists and players, and you can read all about them, or a little bit about them, in, in the program. I would spend the whole evening with you talking about them if, if you got me started, so I won't get started, but I do want to, to have the pleasure and the, the honor to introduce Eve uh, Queller. Uh, and here I would like to take a little digression. Uh, uh, when I was a, a teenager and I was just beginning to, I was just beginning my wonderful you know, love affair with, with opera, uh, someone back in Italy brought to my attention uh, that uh, the Opera Orchestra of New York and Eve Queller had performed Gioacchino Rossini's opera Tancredi, which wasn't heard all that frequently at the time. Not only that, they had performed for the first time the newly discovered tragic finale of that opera, the music of which had been missing up to that point. And if that weren't enough, uh, the cast of that performance included not only Eve Queller on the podium, but also uh, singers such as Ernesto Palacio, uh, Katia Ricciarelli, of whom Chiara Taigi, who is here with us, is, is a wonderful student, and uh, Marilyn Horn. So, now, I went to extraordinary lengths to obtain a recording of that performance, and I don't know how legal it was, but I got it. Uh, and I'm so happy that I did, and I must say that even though I've heard Tancredi many times in my life, that is the performance that is still in my heart and in my uh, ears. Now, indeed, throughout his, her stellar career, Yves Queller has been passionate about and advocating for operas that are rarely performed. You know, so you... you those of you who know her well have heard her performances of, of the greatest operas in, in, in the canon, but they will also have heard a lot of lesser known operas. And uh, we might argue that Il Lombardi alla prima crociata by Verdi is one of those rarely performed operas that uh, we, we hear sometimes thanks to Eve Queller and to her commitment and to, th to her, an unrelenting, and her unrelenting passion. Uh, Eve Queller has conducted over 100 performances at Carnegie Hall. 
uh, and she has appeared at the world-leading uh, opera houses. You have a little, very small, very selected list in your uh, program. So as, uh, as uh, Stefano Albertini said, you know, we're so much better off today thanks to Eve's passion and to her dedication and to her Opera Orchestra of New York, which she founded in 1971. So thank you so much for being with us, Eve. Since we have her here, we have the good fortune to hear her play. On Monday, we're going to hear her conduct, uh, but she's also a marvelous pianist and accompanist. But we're going to make her work even harder. We're going to have her talk to us a little bit. So, because I figured I could talk to you about Verdi forever, uh, and that may or may not be enjoyable, but it is certainly going to be enjoyable to hear uh, Eve Queller's voice and to, 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 to hear something about why I Lombardi alla prima crociata, first of all. What is it that is exciting in early Verdi that, that brings you and us back to it? Well, there is so much. Uh, the thing that attracts me to whichever opera I choose to do is who it was written for, what uh, kind of voices, and can I find the voices for it. That's, that's the way I choose the works that I'm going to do. Um, I don't do it from a musicological or a date or anything like that because uh, Verdi wrote these operas for a specific singer, a specific voice. And if I find the voice, I would like to do that opera. Uh, if I find what I think was the voice that he had in, intended. And in the very beginning, in the first uh, 1972, 73, there were some great singers who wanted to sing repertoire that they weren't being invited to do in New York. And so a number of people asked me for particular operas, and I didn't know those operas. Actually, the first person who asked me for an opera was Nikolai Geta, and he mentioned William Tell, and I only knew the overture. I didn't know it was an opera, <laughs> and I thought, well, yes, the overture is pretty great. Why not try it? And as the years progressed, and we did the Lafricans and the Pearl Fishes, then Montserrat Caballé was interested in Aroldo. Of Verdi, and so I was thrilled to do this for her. Again, I didn't know the piece. I learned all these pieces sometimes from these great singers or together with these great singers. And that's how the number rose to 100. <laughs> 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 and so when, when I find, say, in Verdi, most of the Verdi operas, you, you have to start with the soprano, mostly. You have to start with the soprano. And that's when I Lombardi uh, came up again. This will be my third I Lombardi. And um, the first one was with Renata Scotto and the American debut of Jose Carreras on his 24th birthday. <laughs> and the next one I did with um, Aprile Milo and um, who's the tenor? Uh, was it Bergonzi? Uh, Bergonzi, yeah, Carlo Bergonzi. And also, again, Paul Plischke, when the first time he sang with me, he was singing the sacristan at the Met. And then he became a big star and then repeated it with me. The other thing that I really am very dedicated to is the young singers that are coming up and beginning to flower. I like to put them together with the big stars, the, the singers who travel from place to place and do their roles. Because when these young singers get to sing a duet with the Carlo Bergonzi, who was always very gracious to the young singers, to the covers, um, they, that's another education that they don't get at the conservatory. And it can be leaps ahead for them. And in that way, I was able to um, nurture singers like Deborah Voigt, who covered, like Renee Fleming, who covered, who covered Aprile Milo, I think. And uh, for, um, um, let's say, Renee covered, Deborah Voigt covered, and there's one other being, Aprile was the first cover. She sang William Tell. In those days, we uh, had performances for the covers, and we had a performance at Lehman College 
the Pele Melo, who was uh, just coming into the Met, covering, and then maybe had a debut coming. And uh, people tasted this idea. And so that's been a big thrill for me to uh, always try to organize something for the people who are covering so that you get to hear them. You hear some of them tonight. Um, the reason I chose E. Lombardi was initially I was planning to do Oberto this year because I never did that one. And then I proposed it to Ferruccio Frullinetto, but he had no availability this year. And so I proposed it again to Angela Mead, who will sing in Carnegie Hall next, uh, in Avery Fisher Hall next Monday. Angela accepted. Then she looked at the role and she wrote me, it's a little low for her. And so we went back to Il Lombardi alla Prima Cacciata, which she finds very comfortable. And those, those are the reasons, that's what we look for. Then what we want to talk about with Il Lombardi is what we were talking about at rehearsal. E. Lombardi has one piece in it which is unique in all of opera, certainly in Verdi. It is a trio for three voices with an introduction for a solo violin, which really is a violin concerto. In my, in my knowledge, there is no other opera that has a piece like that. It's incredibly unique and beautiful, virtuosic, and we're gonna play it for you tonight. Uh, and we also got to investigating how Verdi wrote instrumentally, he had this tremendous interest in instrumental music. There is also um, a prelude to E. Masnadieri with a very beautiful cello solo, a sinfonia kind of cello solo. And we're going to play that for you tonight, too. And the first number that we're going to do is the Ave Maria. We'll show how Verdi used uh, flute and clarinet, obbligato, weaving it right through the um, vocal line. I think it's unique for him that he did that. Uh, and I, we were, wanted to talk about that. The other thing also interesting about E. Lombardi is that it has a second large tenor role. And we try to think of what other Verdi opera has two tenors. Um, the second tenor role is a, not a romantic, but he ends the opera because the tenor dies. And so there's a trio. <laughs> and Arvino, the character, who that's is the father. That's why it's good to have another tenor. It's good to have a tenor. Kill you one, never you know, to, you know. You never know when you need one. Better to play it safe. <laughs> and we were thinking about what other Verdi opera would have an important tenor role, and we could only think of Otello with Cassio. Is there any other Verdi opera that you know of that? Not that I can think of. No, I me too. And Otello so. comes almost half a century later. Yeah. So, so those those are the reasons that we found particularly interesting with E. Lombardi, aside from the fact that it's a beautiful work and it's, I think, very inspired piece of music. That's about it. Marvelous. Well, yeah. that's, that's fantastic. Thank you so much, Eve. Thank you. We, we will pick Eve's brains again throughout the evening and, and I'm sure that she and the performers would welcome any questions at the end of tonight's program, uh, which is structured as follows. I will now speak to you for a few minutes, give, give you some coordinates about this, this fascinating early Verdi opera, and then we will listen to a few selections from I Lombardi, and then as a bonus, uh, Eve has already anticipated that we're going to hear a couple of pieces from an other, another rarely performed Verdi opera, I Masnadieri. So, but let us begin with uh, I Lombardi. Uh, following the triumph of Nabucco at Milan's La Scala in 1842, Giuseppe Verdi and librettist Temistocle Solera were arguably the hottest new ticket in the highly competitive world of opera in Milan. The young Verdi had emerged victorious from a difficult period during which he had lost his first wife, Margherita Barezzi, in June 1840, and had faced the devastating fiasco of his second opera, Un Giorno di Regno, the one I've edited, the one that Stefano was talking about. Um, 
And uh, the poet, uh, uh, Solera, whose libretto for Nabucco had been uh, serendipitously assigned to Verdi after another composer had turned it down, was a forceful voice on the operatic stage and an ideal match for the rising star for the composer. So it is no surprise that when arrangements were made for Verdi to produce an other opera at La Scala during the 1842-43 season, uh, the librettist of choice was, again, Solera. And it is no surprise that the two did all in their power to capitalize on, on the success of Nabucco and to replicate several of its features in their new work, I Lombardi alla prima crociata, which, which opened to great acclaim at La Scala on the 11th of February, 1843. Now, whereas Nabucco, as many of you know, draws freely on the biblical story of a Babylonian king, Nebuchadnezzar, uh, for I Lombardi, Verdi and Solera turned to a historical poem as their literary source, a poem by the same, the same title by their Italian contemporary Tommaso Grossi. The story is divided into four acts, like Nabucco, and it follows uh, the uh, vicissitudes of two brothers, Arvino and uh, Pagano, whose uh, love of the same woman has tragic consequences. Pagano mistakenly murders his own father and is, after that, exiled. He becomes a hermit and conducts a life of penance in the Holy Land, providing help and comfort for Christian pilgrims and crusaders. Arvino and his daughter, Giselda, also end up in the Holy Land on the First Crusade, where Giselda, separated from her father, is held prisoner in Antioch. There, she falls in love with the tyrant's son, son Oronte, the other tenor. <laughs> Analogously to Nabucco, the plot of I Lombardi provides numerous opportunities to explore religious themes. Here, in an explicitly Christian context, one of the earliest book-length studies of uh, Giuseppe Verdi's music, uh, a book entitled Studio delle Opere di Giuseppe Verdi by Abramo Basevi, published in 1859, indicates very clearly that religion is a defining feature of I Lombardi, and uh, I hope you'll allow me to quote a few words from Basevi. Uh, it is worth remembering that at that time, the religious ideal was spreading like a fashion so much so that the reigning philosophy was altogether identified with it. Theology had invaded every order of knowledge and Christianity, defended as the foundation of civilization, had acquired a dazzling splendor under the pen of very illustrious writers. Tommaso Grossi was one of those writers and Tosolera was certainly another. So the opening scene of the opera, for example, takes place in the church of St. Ambrose in Milan. Uh, subsequently, we witness a number of prayers, we're going to hear one shortly, processions, the conversion and baptism of Oronte, and uh, even a depiction of, of a biblical uh, site, the Valley of Jehoshaphat. Although the forthcoming performance by the Opera Orchestra of New York is not staged, as, as in the tradition of, of Uni, the religious quality of much of the music will be fully apparent. We, you will hear prayers, you will hear organ-like uh, harmonic progressions and chorale-like passages and, and the glorious final hymn at the end of the opera. Among the main characters, uh, Giselda, in particular, the daughter of Arvino, is a model of uh, rectitude and Christian faith. She prays repeatedly, but she is also able to speak against the slaughter of innocent Muslims at the hand of the Crusaders. So the most powerful poetry in, in the entire libretto, perhaps, is when uh, the crusaders led by Ervino break into the tyrant's palace and free Giselda. But at that point, she fears for the life of Oronte. She believes that he's dead, and she turns against her own people, blaming them uh, in fierce invective for a bloodshed that she claims is not what God's will. Her words are, I'll read them in English only, so Italian speakers among you, please forgive me. Uh, no, it is not God's just cause to shed human blood on the ground. It is wicked insanity, not a pious sentiment that awakens to the gold of the Muslim. These were not heaven's words. No, God does not will it. God does not will it. Stated twice. No, Dio non, Dio non vuole. No, Dio non vuole. Very powerful words. Uh, it is really a beautiful libretto in, as well as beautiful music. Now, although in I Lombardi it is often the chorus that takes pride of place, and to hear that you need to go to Avery Fisher Hall, we have no chorus with us tonight. Uh, uh, but one, uh, one uh, uh, 
uh, one chorus in particular, O Signore dal Teto Natio, in Act 4, was closely modeled after, after Va Pensiero, one could, could argue, although it is very different. Uh, but aside from the importance of the chorus, uh, the individual characters in, the, in this opera are extraordinarily fascinating. We have uh, uh, talked about Giselda, of course, and uh, uh, in addition to being fascinating as characters, they are fascinating as vocal roles, because as Eve explained, singers are so important in opera, and Verdi realized that full well. Sometimes you will read commonplace statements about him, uh, descriptions, uh, statements that, that, uh, that go along the lines, oh, Verdi wanted everything his own way, which is true some, to an extent, uh, and, and he was a tyrant towards his singers. He was the Attila of the voices, which is an expression, <laughs> an expression that mid-19th century Italian critics used. Uh, but the truth of the matter is that he paid a great deal of attention to the performers he had at his disposal, and he was very careful, as Eve is today, uh, in casting the right singers for the right roles. So for Giselda, he had Erminia Frezzolini, one of the leading sopranos of her generation. Uh, gifted with an extraordinary voice and, and a fantastic technique and incredible virtuosity. So he was able to write in a certain way because he had the right singer for that. For Oronte, he had Carlo Guasco, who then went on to create the, 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 the title role in Hernani. For Pagano, the bass, uh, he had Prosper de Rivi, a, a, a French bass who had already sung uh, Zaccaria for him in Nabucco. So we're talking about fine singers for whom he wrote very demanding roles. And Eve is right when she says, to choose an opera, you need to have the right singer, and vice versa. To cast a role in an opera, you need to find the, 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 the right singer, of course. Now, Il Lombardi was every bit as successful as Nabucco. Following its opening night, it was repeated numerous times at La Scala, and within a year, it was produced in a number of Italian cities. Uh, the opera, of course, circulated also internationally, and it might be interesting to know that in 1847, it became the first of Verdi's works to be performed in the United States. And uh, later in 1847, while Il Lombardi made its way to, to, to the States without Verdi, later that year, Verdi himself transformed this opera, adapted it into Jerusalem which was his first work for the Paris Opera. So it is an opera that was destined to, to become international in a number of ways. And now we hear it again in New York, which is the way it should be. Uh, now, while Nabucco, largely thanks to, to, to the iconic chorus of Vapensiero, has prevailed in the eyes of posterity as the opera that embodies the spirit and the style of the early Verdi, uh, Il Lombardi really is no less important. And today, as we celebrate the bicentennial of the great composer, it still comes across as a fresh and extraordinarily vibrant score. Uh, with stirring dramatic situations, confrontations, death on stage, uh, and of course filled with memorable music, extraordinary tunes, and providing glimpses of Verdi's later achievements. Eve has rightly mentioned that you have these two tenors. It's, it's an, an, an extraordinary uh, feature and perhaps probably only a coincidence, but it happens again in Otello. There is, and, and uh, uh, with this we turn to the first piece on our program, uh, there is in this opera an Ave Maria, a prayer to the Virgin Mary, and there is another one in Otello. In this case, we're dealing with the first Ave Maria, the first prayer to the Virgin composed for the Italian stage. Now, the censors did not look favorably on this kind of stuff in, in pre-unification Italy, and in fact, uh, an, an unknown hand went into Verdi's autograph score of, of Il Lombardi and entered two letters between the letter A and the letter V of Ave, thus transforming it into Salve. It's a little instance of, of censorship. The prayer stays, but the beginning, which sounded too liturgical for, from the censor's perspective, was changed. When the opera traveled to other cities, the text was changed completely so that every, any reference to the Virgin Mary uh, disappeared, or the whole prayer was altogether omitted. So you can see how modern this opera is and how the young Verdi was already pushing on certain fronts to, to make his voice heard in a novel uh, way. Now, this magnificent aria reveals one of the fundamental traits of, the, of early Verdi, which is the ability to write not only the big choral scenes with full orchestra, lots of sound, lots of you know, visible mass on stage, but also 
to score intimately. Eve has told us that this prayer, this Ave Maria, is accompanied with a chamber-like texture. There is you know, tremolo in the strings, but then we have this flute and this clarinet, which play a very important role in depicting the character and depicting the situation. Uh, you know, uh, Giselda is in her room. She's, she's, she's you know, very worried with, 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 with her mother. She doesn't really know what's going on at the palace. Soon they will discover that Pagano has murdered uh, his own father. So it is a tense moment in the opera, and this prayer just leaves you waiting to exhale, as it were. And uh, I would now like to invite to the stage uh, uh, the first you know, three uh, performers this evening uh, so that we can hear this, this wonderful Ave Maria from, from Eve Queller, Chiara Taigi, and members of the orchestra, of, of the Opera Orchestra of New York. They are coming. So who walks in first? Soprano, of course.
that should be more than enough to put to rest those who say that early Verdi could not orchestrate and that his music was always um pa pa um pa pa. <laughs> there are some um pa pa, but they're useful. You know, that's when you want the, the, con the, the, the focus to be on the melody. Now, um, when uh, we move on to act two of the opera, the, the action shifts from Milan, where it begins, to um, Antioch on the way to, to, to the Holy Land. And, and uh, again, um, Giselda is held prisoner by the tyrant. Her, his son, the, the tyrant's son, uh, Oronte, has fallen in, in love with her. Um, and her mother has died. Uh, and uh, we encounter early in Act Two, we encounter Oronte, who sings in the tradition of Primo Ottocento opera. He sings a double aria consisting of a cantabile, uh, you know, slow cantabile section, and then uh, a uh, cabaletta. Um, and uh, this is this is uh, you you can tell that you needed someone like Carlo Guasco to to sing a piece like this. It's it, it is one of those arias that show the the nascent uh, Verdian tenor, lyrical, romantic, but, but, but also robust. So I would like now to invite to the stage Diego Silva, who is going to sing this aria for us. Ready for another tenor? <laughs> Good. You know, in the early part of the century, in the early part of the 19th century, it was not uncommon to have two tenors in, in an opera. Uh, Rossini routinely uh, provided two tenor roles in, in uh, most of his uh, Neapolitan opera series. In Armida, which uh, Eve Queller has conducted with, with Rene Fleming, I was actually lucky to be there for real. I didn't have to look for an illegal recording. Uh, Armida contains how many tenor roles, Eve? Is it six tenors in, uh, in Armida? 
probably six. Uh, um, so so we, sh we shouldn't be surprised if we find so many tenors in those earlier operas, but, but by the time Verdi came along, that tradition uh, had, uh, had faded, and uh, uh, it is truly extraordinary to find this significant role for Arvino, which Eve told us rightly is not a romantic role. He's a father role. Verdi writes marvelous father roles throughout uh, his career, from Rigoletto to, to Philip II in Don Carlo, uh, just stunning roles. And this is an unusual one because, because again, it is cast for, for a tenor. And it is a rather forceful part because Arvino is not only Giselda's father and presumably an aging man, but he's actually a warrior. We encounter here, we, we encounter him uh, at, in Act Three at the point where he has discovered that his brother, who has murdered their own father, is not far away. You know, he's somewhere in the Holy Land, and at, at this point, uh, he makes an oath. He, he, he swears that he's going to, to, uh, to track him down, to track down Pagano and kill him. So it is, it, is, it is an important point, and it is an aria where Verdi does not adopt the usual structure. There is a sense of urgency. There is no time for a cantabile. So you have uh, an aria that pushes for the end, fast tempo, important involvement of the chorus, which you will hear on Monday, uh, and very uh, demanding uh, part for the tenor, even though it is a relatively uh, short piece. So let me introduce and welcome uh, John Viscardi, who is going to be singing Arvino for us.
And we now turn to the next piece in, uh, uh, in um, act, act One of the opera. We turn to the trio in, uh, uh, that concludes Act Three, in which Oronte dies in Giselda's arms. It is a highly dramatic moment, but religion is there. And uh, Pagano, who has become a hermit, and lives a life of penance, as I told you before, is there when he's needed to offer conversion, to offer baptism. So Oronte, who was already tempted to become a Christian for the love of, of uh, Giselda, uh, Oronte uh, uh, converts, and, and in this way he's saved. He then makes a posthumous appearance later in the opera, you'll hear it on Monday. In act four, he comes back from the dead to say, you know, here I am in heaven, thanks to you, Giselda, and uh, and things uh, and things come to come full circle. Yeah, I'm 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 being funny, you know, uh, of course, benevolently funny. This is these are things that happen in opera sometimes, <laughs> but uh, um, uh, but uh, it is really an extraordinary moment. Now, for this trio, we have. Uh, uh, not only three fabulous singers, Chiara Taigi, whom uh, you've already uh, heard, Diego Silva, uh, and uh, Kevin Short, who sang Un Giorno di Regno uh, in, uh, in uh, uh, Sarasota with my edition for his sins, and he did such a fabulous job. Hi, Kevin. Um, uh, we also have uh, Erika uh, uh, Kiesewitter, who is the, the, the principal violin in uh, the Opera Orchestra of New York. So we're very lucky to have her here, and we get to hear the whole violin introduction that Eve was telling us about. Uh, Verdi wrote this for Eugenio Cavallini. Uh, Eugenio Cavallini was the principal violin of, uh, uh, of uh, La Scala. Uh, he, we don't know much about his relationship with Verdi because both were based in Milan at the time, so we don't have correspondence documenting the origin of this extraordinary solo for the violin. What we do know is the music itself, which is wonderful. It speaks for the abilities of uh, Cavallini as a performer, and it speaks, again, for Verdi's sensitivity, sensitivity, his ability to, to write music that was appropriate, that was right for uh, his performers. So without further ado, uh, let us welcome again Chiara Taigi and Diego Silva, and let us welcome uh, Kevin Short and, and, and Erika Kisevitter for this fabulous trio.
Thank you. 
This might be a good, memo, a good moment to mention a, you know, someone we'd all like to be here today, and that is uh, uh, Stanley Queller, uh, Eve's um, husband, who left us you know, a couple of months ago. Uh, and I think his birthday would be tomorrow. And I've never had the good fortune to meet him, but I know from all who have, uh, who was a wonderful man and, and, uh, and uh, uh, a great music lover. So I'd like all of us to take a moment to think of Stanley Queller before we proceed. Thank you. And now I know that you would all love to hear Act 4 of Il Lombardi, but there's not a note of that tonight, but lots of notes of that in, in six days, including Orontes' return from the dead uh, and, and the, the wonderful chorus of, uh, of uh, uh, Crusaders and the, the final hymn. But Eve, in, in, in her you know, extraordinary generosity and, and energy, said, well, let's do something else. You know, as if this weren't enough, let's, let's have more early Verdi. And how could we say no to that? So you know, don't go away say, saying that you didn't get an encore. You're just about to get two, uh, both of them from Verdi's I Masnadieri, the opera with which he made his debut in, in London in 1847. Uh, that was the big international year for Verdi, with I Lombardi performed in the States for the first time, Jerusalem, uh, which I mentioned before, for the Paris Opera, and uh, before Jerusalem, Imas Nadieri for London. Um, I, I, I have no business telling you the story of Imas Nadieri. It is, by the way, quite complex. Uh, but what I can tell you is that, again, uh, as he went to London, Verdi was very careful to write for specific performers. And uh, th there were fine singers, to be sure, in the opera, and I'll tell you more about that in a minute. But there was a very special uh, uh, soloist in, uh, in the orchestra of, of, uh, of the King's Theatre in London. His name was Alfredo Piatti. He was a fine cellist, and Verdi certainly thought of him when he wrote the opening um, uh, prelude to, uh, to the opera, which contains a marvelous uh, one movement, you know, sort of plaintive melody for the cello, and, and uh, uh, Eve invited Eugene Moy, the, the first cellist of, uh, principal cellist of opera orchestra of, uh, uh, of New York, who is here with us, and we're very grateful for that. So let me invite uh, Eugene Moy to come to the stage, and uh, we are about to hear the prelude from Impas Nadieri. And uh, uh, Eugene, I understand you no longer need a chair from me, right? <laughs> Looks like we're quite busy. I wish I could have helped you with that. Look at that.
to conclude our program. Uh, I've already thanked Eve for her generosity, and, and I thank her again, but I should also thank uh, Chiara Taigi, who, you know, in addition to having done a lot of singing from, uh, from I Lombardi, and you know, I so wish that Eve Queller and the Opera Orchestra of New York could do two performances of I Lombardi, one for each cast, uh, because uh, you know, Kevin Short is singing on Monday, but, 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 but the other singers were hearing tonight. This was our chance, and what a chance we had. Uh, so you know, perhaps next next time you, you can give us two performer, uh, two performances, two full performances of the opera, um, and uh, uh, Chiara Taigi again, in addition to having sung parts of I Lombardi, has agreed to sing uh, the uh, aria for, Ama uh, for Amalia in uh, Imaznadieri. Uh, for this character, Verdi worked with, uh, uh, with the celebrated Jenny Lind, uh, the Swedish soprano who was uh, you know, e extremely well known, pretty much like Frizzolini, for, for her virtuosity. Uh, and uh, he wrote a very, very demanding role for, for, uh, for this uh, uh, part because he could afford it. And, and we, we can afford to hear this aria today because we have, uh, we have Chiara Taigi uh, with us. So um, uh, I don't think that it should be my words to conclude this program. I, sh I think it should be uh, Chiara Taigi and, uh, uh, and Eve Queller's music and, and Verdi's music, of course. So let me thank you now for, uh, for taking part in this evening's event, and let me thank Eve Queller once more time and all of, of our performers. Uh, you know that, that this performance is taking place at Lincoln Center from our website, uh, the, the website of the American Institute for Verdi Studies, from the website of the Casa Italiana, you have easy access to the virtual box office of Lincoln Center. So I trust that, that you know what to do. Uh, and I look forward to seeing all of you on Monday and uh, uh, certainly at, our, our, at future events here at the Casa Italiana and with the American Institute for Verdi Studies. Thank you very much for joining us and welcome again Chiara Taigi.
Thank you.